talk to foster a global happiness and well-being movement. Um, these are online free webinars. Most of the people who are giving the talks at the beginning were at the meeting at the United Nations that was held by the government of Bhutan and the United Nations, where we were charged to foster a global happiness and well-being movement at a very grassroots level. So this is part of this. Our presenter today is John Hall. I'll say a few words about him. But before I do, I want to mention that um, we see this as an ongoing project, as a as a collaborative project, looking for other people to help um, coordinate with these and to help um, in any way that they would like to be a part of this. Um, we send out the information about the talks prior to the talk so that you can cut, essentially cut and paste that and let other people know about it as something that you're involved in. If you have questions about that or are more interested in the, um, the intent and the administration of this and being involved as, and part of this project, please just let me know, Laura, at happycounts.org. So we've got another minute or two. So I'm going to um, go ahead and give that as minutes to happen so that we can make sure everybody's logged in and then we'll go ahead and get started. It's 22, 22 now. now. Yeah. So. All right. All right. So it's, I have it as officially nine, nine o'clock Pacific time, noon uh, time on the East Coast. So we'll go ahead and get started. So I'm going to say welcome to everybody again. I already did, but I want to give everybody a welcome. Um, these are the, the talks to foster a global happiness and well being movement. We'd like to encourage people if they're interested in doing these talks or in administering these talks or in other ways being a part of it, please let me know, Lauren at happycounts.org. This is our second talk. Our first talk was given by Yamuna David, um, and it was a real success. You can get a copy of that on Basecamp. You'll be able to get collateral material and copies of this talk or recordings of this talk on Basecamp. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. A little bit more administration. If you have a question, um, which we hope that you do because these are these talks are half presentation, half question. Please put it in your chat or in the questions. You should see that on your menu or raise your hand. There's a way for you to, to hit the little raise your hand. Um, and at the end, I'll go ahead and, and, and open it up so that you can talk. It's a lot better if you have mic and speakers. But if you, and if you don't, you might create um, some negative feedback that comes in screeching. So then I would silence you and then you'd have to just go ahead and ask your question in the question or the chat. You should see a, a, a block box that says a control panel and then little drop down arrows that you can hit to do questions um, or, or, or to chat. Okay, so this is our second um, talk and very, very pleased and thank you so much, John, for joining us. It's John, John Hall who's right now working with the Human Development Report Office in the United Nations. John helped the government of Australia to develop their, their measures of progress. Um, and, and, um, and really, that's something that for me as a sustainability, um, we call it something like a sustainability um, expert in a sense, um, the, what the government of Australia did really was really led led the nation. So it's a real honor to have John here. He's going to talk a little bit about um, what he's doing at the United Nations and where he sees the happy, global happiness and well-being movement. And John, um, apologies for uh, not very good introduction. Okay. With that, I'm going to send, um, give it over to you, and I'll be silencing myself. So you'll be um, you'll be the presenter and the sole speaker. So thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, Laura. Um, it's very strange for me to be giving a presentation like this where I can't see anyone. So please do, uh, everyone, interrupt as best you can with a chat or putting your hand up wherever there are different things you can do and I can stop. I, um, 
I didn't really know what to talk about. I mean, there's so many things I could talk about. I thought on this that would be could be interesting. So in the end, I ended up sort of thinking we could talk a bit about why a sort of broad and really broad conversation about why I think measures of happiness and subjective well-being and how that ties into behavioral economics, how they're really going to change the world, um, that how those understanding, that, that understanding of the, the way we behave and what motivates us, what makes us happy, why that is going to change everything, uh, the way we govern ourselves, the way we set up um, our, our, our systems of government, all the decisions we take, all of those things, I think, are going to change quite profoundly over the next 20 years. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about that and some of the things that interest me about this. And then we can have a broader conversation, perhaps, about the way this movement is heading, the work that the Bhutanese are doing, what the UN is doing. Um, I mean, I'm sort of involved a little bit in the Millennium Development Goals and the post-2015 development agenda, um, which is, we can talk about that later, but you know, there is talk about happiness informing that more. The Bhutanese are trying very hard with the work they're doing to, to influence that conversation, which is really what the UN is talking about more than anything at the moment. But let's talk about some of the sort of science and interesting stuff behind this first. Um, so this is, you know, thinking about happiness is is not new. It's been around since the time of the ancient Greeks and talking about eudaimonia and the idea of a better life. What I think is new is that the science has really come on in the last 20 or 30 years. Um, and it's if you look at the numbers of academic papers produced, it's, it's exponential, the growth. It's, it's more and more people are, are working on this, and it's, it's just evolving very, very rapidly. There are two key questions, I suppose, we, we should talk about as absolute fundamental. How do we measure subjective well-being? And when I say subjective well-being, this really means happiness. Um, but it's a slightly broader, more scientific-sounding uh, way to describe what is essentially happiness. How do we measure that and why? You know, what, Even if we can measure it, why do we care? Why do we need to measure this? Um, so how do we measure it? Well, before you can measure something, you, know, you need to know what you're talking about. What is subjective well-being? Um, really, I suppose, like, in a broader sense, how individuals rate the quality of their lives. Um, and there are two broad scientific schools of thought on how you measure this 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 thing, perception of quality of life. One is a sort of overall, how do individuals evaluate the quality of their lives? You know, on a scale of one to ten, overall, do you think you know life is getting better, or you're happy, or any questions like that, broad ones. The second um, way to do it is to look at how people feel, both good and bad, their emotions, uh, in the moment, either as you experience them or as you remember them. If you he said, yeah, you know, how did you feel yesterday? Or how do you feel this very second listening to this, this boring guy from the UN give a presentation? Um, and these different questions, are, they're all sort of, people will argue with them and academics might get very excited about which is the, the best, but I mean, they've got different uses. Um, so a, a broad sort of how satisfied with your, are you with your life is, is it's pretty consistent. When you ask people, people don't. That, you know, they, they, that changes slowly and gradually. It's not influenced by the fact that you had a terrible commute to work that day or the sun shining. Um, people, you know, if you ask people at the weekend whether they're happier at the moment, they will say generally yes, they're happy at the weekend, but they're not any more satisfied with life overall on average. Um, so if you're looking at overall sort of life satisfaction and well-being, uh, probably how the Bhutanese sort of see this more, then the, these life satisfaction questions are probably the most important to actually understand how people are feeling overall. Um, the momentary assessments, which are either, I mean, based they're based on time use diaries generally, which is, you know, what are you doing, what were you doing yesterday, and how are you feeling? The best ones, I think, are probably when it captures it live. So you've got your iPhone or whatever buzzes in your pocket. People running a survey will set, set it up like this. It will buzz and it will say, what are you doing now, and how do you feel? Um, and again, these show different different answers. I mean, the way we feel at the moment is rather different to how we remember it. Um, and this is uh, partly it's a defense mechanism because if you, you know, the classic is time spent with children. Um, if you ask people, parents, what makes them happy, they will generally list spending time with their kids as one of the um, one of the things that you know, brings happiness to their lives. 
that's how they remember it, that's how we, we perceive it, but if you actually ask people during the course of a day, what are you doing, how happy are you feeling, it's probably not a great surprise that time spent with children is often at the very bottom of the things that make you happy. Um, I mean, generally, you know, ninety percent of it is they're fighting, they're crying, they're moaning, they're complaining. Um, but we forget all that when we we remember it the next day or the next week, and we just remember the smile and the the bedtime story. So, you know, it's the same with pain. There's very interesting work by people like Daniel Kahneman who look at um, how people experience uh, dental dental treatment, and you're much more likely to have a positive memory of how it felt, how it was, if you have all the pain at the beginning. So you could, you know, it ends quite nicely. Um, so if you're a dentist and you want the patient to come back and there's a certain amount of pain you have to give during this treatment, then spread the pain out through the, the whole treatment and make sure the last five minutes is nice. Don't give them 55 minutes of really quite a nice and then uh, a, uh, a procedure and then the last five minutes, you know, make it really painful because that's what, what um, affects people's experience. It's just very interesting. This is the way the human mind works. Which, you know, again, it's which is the more important to understand? Well, if you're trying to use this, if you're someone who's interested in how people behave and what motivates people's behavior, then it's probably the, the latter. I mean, the real-time stuff might be more accurate, but really it's how people think and remember their experiences that's going to be more important, I think. If you're a policymaker, you're trying to design something that can motivate you know, understands what motivates people, so you're picking up on that. Um, again, different questions, different uses. People, one of the obvious, we have spoken to Amartya Sen, or how did Amartya Sen talk about this? He's one of the gurus of, of well-being and of just beyond GDP. Um, you know, he's been talking about this for a long time. He's, you know, quite um, skeptical about some of the happiness stuff, but this is based um, based on data that's from a long time ago, you know, from 30, 30 years ago, I think, when I heard him talk about this. He said, well, it didn't work in India, we did this and this. and It wasn't so good, but, um, you know, the science is improving now, and so you can ask people, um, people are really quite good at assessing themselves quite accurately, it seems. So, for example, self to assess health, we ask someone how healthy they are. Um, it, it declines with age, so if you ask someone who's 70, how healthy they are, they generally say they don't feel as good on a scale of 1 to 10 as someone who's 20. But if you then ask that age group to compare themselves with their peers, the decline changes, it's then relative. So it shows we're quite, you know, people are quite smart, uh, quite in tune with, with, with themselves in the world. Um, another problem or a alleged problem with the happiness data is that it's, it's um, it, you can't compare across cultures. Some cultures don't have a word even for happiness. It doesn't make any sense. You know, you ask the same question to someone in Norway and someone in Kenya, are they really asking it the same way? And this it means a very complicated set of research on this, and you can argue, well, maybe it doesn't even matter. Maybe that's not the point. But if again, it shows it's fairly, cons and you do get accurate answers. The life evaluation ladder, uh, the Cantrell ladder is one of the classic life evaluation questions, you know, on a picture ladder, or what, which rung are you at, depending on how happy you are. And Ed Diener, one of the sort of the gurus of the happiness a academia, looked at uh, how different countries answered this. And it's, you know, look on the left and the right. The countries on the, on the left-hand side, um, there are the countries you typically think quality of life is pretty, is pretty reasonable, Denmark and Switzerland and Spain and Ireland. Uh, and on the right, the most miserable, um, or the most, you know, people who evaluate their lives most pessimistic, pessimistically, again, they're the countries that you can imagine um, are the places where life really isn't so good, and Zimbabwe, Sierra Leone, and West Bank. So again, you know, whatever we can talk about, whether this is, you can compare countries, but there's there's evidence just there that it's it's fairly robust. Some of this stuff, if you're trying to compare countries. Um, so I, I, that's in a nutshell, very very quick um, run through how you actually measure different approaches to measure this and some of the the problems and, and why they're, maybe they're not really problems uh, in the data. So if we've got some measures and we can start measuring this stuff, why do we need to? Um, I think there are four reasons. First, happiness is a legit legitimate goal of public policy. Um, second, uh, subjective well-being, SWV, that it does drive and influence our objective well-being. And objective well-being is the stuff the statisticians, we statisticians are much happier measuring. 
because we can touch it, we can count it, we can get a tape measure out or a calendar or a calculator, and we can actually calculate, you know, how long people live, how um, how tall they are, how much money they're earning, all of these things, you know, you know, real solid statistics on this, or so we like to think. Um, we might be a bit more skeptical about the happiness stuff sometimes, but it does, there's really good evidence now that it drives um, some of the objective stuff. Um, I think happiness has got a tremendous potential um, in this whole realm of measuring development, progress, sustainability, quality of life, well-being. Anyone who wants to get the debate beyond GDP, then um, I think happiness measures can probably do that better than anything else. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, and I also think for policymakers, it's fascinating that when you start thinking about subjective well-being, it really leads to new conversations and new ideas. And this is something that's really just starting to happen now that um, policymakers are seriously collecting this stuff, and they're collecting it in the UK. And uh, Pepe, who I think is on the line from Mexico, is saying an in in Mexico collecting this. A lot of governments now are starting to do so once this data comes out it's going to lead to a whole set of new conversations but let's talk about these four things um, happiness is a legitimate goal of public policy well the Bhutanese think so with their gross national happiness uh, which I'm sure most if not all of you are aware of this concept that you know development isn't about just growing the economy it's about trying to maximize the happiness of people in Bhutan broadly defined because happiness is the one thing that all Bhutanese have in common if you ask every Bhutanese what, what they share and want from life, they all they'll say we want to be happy. That was the prime minister, prime minister's point, which I think is a very good one. And it, you know, it's it's equally legitimate in the U.S. We're in a life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's fundamental to the you know the, the foundations of this nation. So the, so there are people who say, well, this isn't any business of government to um, to pursue happiness. Well, you know, it, it is. I think be careful how you do it. You might want to like the Bhutanese not try and force people to be happy but try and set the right environment in which people live, the right sort of framework for, for society and the economy and the environment so that people can actually achieve happiness on their own. But I think it's perfectly legitimate and you know, can't really be against this surely. Um, second, the links between happiness and objective well-being. This is really, really interesting stuff. Um, very, very hard to measure and hard to do experiments on because if you're trying to do some sort of laboratory experiment um, a, you can't put people in a laboratory generally, and it's very, very hard to um, control, you know, in scientific statistical terms, control for the things that might lead to happiness that might also be driving objective well-being. So what I mean by that is, if you're, tr let's say, you have a hypothesis that happy people um, are healthier and live longer, so like a reasonable hypothesis. But how on earth can you test this? Because you might say, well. Yeah, well, look, they, they do. Let's look at the links. You know, these happy people, we follow them and they're living longer. Well, fine, but maybe those happy people are also in better relationships or have got better jobs and are earning more money. And maybe it's the money that's actually leading to the health, the greater health, or the happier relationships or the happier families that somehow promote the health because they reduce stress rather than the happiness itself. Very, very hard to disentangle all these threads because, you know, life is incredibly complex and we can't, we can't test everything. But scientists are very, very inventive, and they've thought of very clever ways to come up with these natural experiments, natural laboratories, um, to test some of this stuff. And my favorite, which I'm sure some of you will know, is about the nuns in Milwaukee. And somebody um, a few years ago came up with a great idea of thinking about happiness and health, wondering how can we test, how can we find a laboratory, a natural experiment. They thought of uh, nuns, because nuns do live essentially in a laboratory. Many of the, the, the differences in our day-to-day -day lives um, between the, you know, all of us are controlled for if you're a nun living in a convent or a religious order, because you, I, I guess, you wake up the same time, you eat, the, eat at the same time, you eat the same food, you do a similar amount of work, you, know, you even wear the same clothes. So, so much of this stuff is controlled for. So if, you can, if we knew somehow how happy these women were, and we knew how long they lived, there would be you know, a chance there to really demonstrate a link. Now, when women joined this convent in Milwaukee, this order in Milwaukee, in the 1930s, they had to write a letter application. And those letters were available on, on file. And so researchers went through and they graded each letter on a scale of one to three, where one was a, 
a happy letter, and these were the women who were writing, saying, my heart's full of joy for the world and for God, and I want to do good things, and they were sort of seen as a happy, a happy nun. And then there were those who used lots of more negative words, who felt guilt, uh, wanted to atone for their sins, and these kind of things, who were joining for that reason. And they were sort of rated as the miserable, the miserable group. So three groups. They then looked ahead into uh, 50, 60 years and see how long these women who joined in their 20s, how long they lived. And they found that, uh, and this is a fairly big sample, it was hundreds of people, they found that the happiest group um, were living, I think, 10, 10 years longer on average than the most miserable. Uh, a much greater proportion of the happy group were living to be beyond 85 than the, um, the miserable group. I mean, really striking. These are the sort of differences you might find between uh, people in the US and people living in sub-Saharan Africa, for example. I mean, it was you know, really, really striking. 10 years life expectancy is a sort of game that's been made in the US, I guess, in 100 years, um, if you look at the, the, the data. So really, really striking. Very strong evidence there that happiness um, does link with health. I mean, other researchers have found that happiness seems to link with every sort of kind of ailment you can get from the common cold upwards. Um, you know, happy people get this don't suffer as much from these things, recover more quickly. Researchers found that even that giving someone a view uh, of green space and a, a window in a hospital room led to a quicker recovery time, less complications. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of evidence. It's very partial, very difficult to collect, but it's there and it's growing all the time. So a very strong evidence there that happiness uh, links into health, which then raises questions if you're a, a government or a politician trying to spend money on health care, the, the sort of questions will hang on. You know, we might spend 100 million on some new hospitals, or maybe if we spent 50 million on promoting um, social cohesion or something we know makes people happier, maybe that would actually be a better way to spend that money on health than the hospitals. So these are the sorts of questions that this kind of evidence throws up to policymakers. Um, there's some data there on the nuns, so you can see the the happiest four groups, apparently quartile. The happy 90 percent of the happiest quartile live to be over 85, compared to only a third of the least happy and equally striking for up to 90, 94 years old. So very, very strong data. They've even actually found this now with orangutans. So I think in San Diego Zoo they were looking at their orangutans and they sort of assessed the ones that were happy and miserable and the happy ones were living longer. So you know, if orangutans, it works for orangutans, it works for nuns in Milwaukee, then it probably works for, for you know, most of the US population, even people working at the United Nations. Um, you know, there's a virtuous circle with some of this stuff. You're trying to understand that trust. I think most people agree is you know very important to the way an economy runs in a society. It's governments can't govern if there's no trust in them. It is vitally important glue that binds us together, and trust uh, comes from having more social connections, and so does happiness. And having more social connections leads to more happiness, which leads to more trust. So these things can spiral in positive feedback. Um, Subject to well-being can promote a facts-based um, debate about the statistics that matter. Now, this is probably my the thing I've worked on most in the last fifteen years, I guess. Now, uh, the idea that GDP is a was never meant to be a measure of progress is a really poor measure of progress. Yet, it's used as a measure of progress. And how can we change that debate? How can we have new measures that are used? Hence, the work I did in Australia um, on sort of progress measures there work I was doing at the OECD on running a global project to measure the progress of society. There are many, many, many measures, alternative measures to GDP, and there's more each year. Um, Human Development Index, which I work on here at the UN, is one of them, one of the most famous ones. The problem I think now is not that we have, we don't have alternatives, it's getting them used. Um, it's all very well to create a great statistic that's much better than GDP in measuring well-being or quality of life, but it doesn't mean people can start using it. You can't force people to start using this thing. Uh, GDP is regular, it comes, it's one number, it's, it appears all the time. How can you challenge that um, hegemony of GDP? Well, I think subject to well-being has probably got more of a chance of doing this than anything else. It's incredibly popular. Um, people love this stuff. You start talking about many of these composite measures of well-being and quality of life and people's eyes glaze over. You talk to people about how happy they are and everyone wants to see, they want to look and they understand for themselves. It, resonates, you can compare countries, people can compare uh, towns or cities in the states. So it's a very powerful way to get the stuff on the news and that's the first thing. Get it into the media, get people talking about this. If you want to challenge something, you've got to get people interested. Um, 
it's something that everyone can can, can have an opinion on. And um, there was a nice the Gallup World poll looks at this, looks at um, how happy people are in the U.S. with a thousand people a day, and they did a nice thing a year or a year and a half ago, completely unscientific, but they looked at different characteristics of people that made them happy and put them all together to create this, you know, uh, super happy person who would be tall, Asian American, Jewish, lives in Hawaii, so on, so on, and then they sort of said they actually found someone who met all these criteria. And again, it was a piece of sort of pop science, and it wasn't very, very useful for anything except it got the news headlines and got people talking. And it was really some really nice articles and people talking about this. And you know, this guy was a, I think, a university professor, and they had his ex-students talking. You know, he was a really happy, really happy teacher. It's true, this stuff really works. It's a way to get people thinking, a way to start people thinking that, you know, money isn't really the, the end game. It's money is important, but it's not what matters, it's happiness at the end of the day that really matters to our quality of lives and, 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 and how we enjoy us, it's the meaning of life. Um, so you can imagine a sort of regular happiness indicator uh, each week or each month that comes out and that would, you know, it would fluctuate for a country and it would trigger discussion, it might, um, you know, if it goes up or down, then the, the, the newspaper is going, well, why? Why has this changed? What's happening? You might, you might look at groups, it might have gone up for women or down for men or, you know, why are over 65s in Florida all of a sudden feeling less miserable? Could it be because of the tax changes or could it be because of this? Um, it would then be a window into the whole wealth of data we know is important for our well-being. Uh, it's, you know, happiness is a summary indicator, it's certainly not the only thing that matters. But if you're trying to have a more sensible, mature debate, it's more mature than GDP about the things that matter to life in any country, then you need to look at, sure you need to look at economic data, social data, health, crime, education, environmental data, and having some super measure, summary measure of happiness would get people talking and would then trigger a more in-depth conversation about the different things that matter. So I think you know, it could be this Trojan horse for having this fact-based debate, which um, so many of us want to have. Um, and then finally, I think the other thing is why this is so interesting and will become more and more interesting is that when you start looking at policy through uh, a lens of subjective well-being, it starts generating new ideas. Um, Daniel Kahneman is a psychologist who won the Nobel Prize for Economics for his work on behavioral economics. And, like, really fascinating stuff, looking at how this is a lot of this time diaries in real time with computers buzzing and people filling in how they're feeling. Looking at what really motivates people and how we really experience all of these things. Um, you know, one of the fundamental tenets of economics is that we are supposed, people, human beings, uh, seek to maximize their own utility. That is one of the Ten Commandments of economics. A lot of the, everything that flows, flows from this. And utility is usually measured in dollars. That's, it actually means more than that, but economists say, well, hang on, this really it's about maximizing utility, and we know that money is a proxy for that, so that drives you know, a heck of a lot of economic theory. But um, if you actually start to think about this, it doesn't really work in reality. So there's a question here. Which would you prefer, that you and all your colleagues at work receive a $1,000 pay rise tomorrow? Or you, tomorrow you go to work, you get a $2,000 pay rise, but all of your colleagues, everyone else in the building, gets $5,000. Now, if you're trying to maximize your own utility, it doesn't really matter what the people sitting next to you get paid. $2,000 in your pocket is better than $1,000. You can spend an extra $1,000. So economic theory says that um, B is the best, you know, that maximizes your utility. Human nature, though, I think most people would go for, for the first one. It just seems patently unfair that I get 2000 and all my people sitting around me get five. It would just be, you know, it would just piss me off. So, um, that's an, a, a classic example of where this stuff doesn't work, you know, where economics doesn't work. And if it doesn't, then that raises big questions into what motivates people. And if you're a policymaker who is trying to motivate, understand what motivates people, which has got to be key to getting any piece of policy to work, you need to understand all this. You can't just rely on economic theory because it doesn't actually work. Um, you know, some of the other things that people have looked at, uh, looking at what the happiness in couple relationships and people's uh, labor market status. The happiest uh, state of all is to be employed, both of you, you and your partner. 
the next happy says you have got a job and your partner doesn't. What's interesting is actually the 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 most unhappy. It ought to be when you're both unemployed. You think they need you know, no money coming in, both miserable. In fact, the worst thing is if you are unemployed and your partner has a job. That makes you more miserable. So, you know that is that's important for policy making. Maybe instead of trying to get um, for an example why this might be important. Instead, if you've got, you could look at sort of households rather than individuals. If you're trying to sort of maximise well-being with an employment policy, where you've got people, two people who are both unemployed, rather than trying to find one of them a job, maybe it'd be better to find them both part-time jobs. For example, um, you know, there's many implications. There's some of this isn't. You know, you can say about it's the same if you're overweight. You feel happier around other people who are overweight. Uh, you don't want to go and live in Paris. You might want to go and live in the Midwest or somewhere. So, you know, so Derek, I don't know what it means for policy. I do not know what some of this really means for policy, other than that it's got to be important to understand this stuff, got to know this stuff, even if we don't choose not to act act from it. So, um, I think this, this is interesting. My screen's not changing. Hold on. Um, another really interesting. This is another sort of one of these geeky natural experiments comes from Holland, where in the Netherlands they have a lottery each week and it's a postcode lottery so you buy a ticket uh, I guess quite an expensive ticket and if your zip code your postcode comes up uh, that week you win a prize and the prize is it was a new BMW it's a substantial prize so again they had a natural experiment here they could look at what happened in those neighborhoods and there must be very small postcodes in the Netherlands look looked at what happened in those neighborhoods which won the lottery and car buying actually went up in those neighborhoods and it should have gone down because more people were given given new cars but what was happening was people were waking up in the morning and they were looking out the window and they were seeing their neighbors who had a lottery ticket had a shiny new BMW in the drive and they were motivated people who hadn't bought the ticket were then motivated to go out and buy a new car so the keeping up with the Joneses well this is real I mean it really does motivate people again this is important if you're trying to set policy and design a society and where people have got higher well-being. Um, these sort of feelings matter incredibly for policy. You need to understand both. You know, there might be people who are skeptical that happiness is the be-all and end-all, but you do need to understand both. What, what objectively is happening and what people, how people feel, because you've got very different policy responses. If you're living in a society where people feel good and they ought to feel good, that's well-being. Uh, where they they don't feel good and they've they've got every right not to feel good, that's deprivation. Um, there it's kind of clear what you do. It's much more complicated where people are really happy but they shouldn't be, where they've adapted. Well, they really should be trying a bit harder but they're just kind of used to it and life's okay but they, they could be striving for more. Or where they're miserable and they shouldn't be. They've actually, you know, they've never had it so good but they don't, they don't realize that. Very, very different responses if you're a policy maker. Um, you need to understand all that. And an example might be uh, crime where it's not really the real crime rate that drives people's well-being or behavior it's the fear of crime it's what you think is going to happen is governs whether you leave your house at night and walk down the street it doesn't really matter what the real crime rate is I mean ideally the two things should match uh, your fear should be matched on the reality but it's not often like that so you know, different responses an individual if you live in a society where you're afraid and there's a risk of crime then your doors are probably locked you already have a dog and you might be sending an angry message off to the mayor um, somewhere where you don't fear crime but you ought to then you know you should be told start locking your doors start by a dog and then you should email your mayor if you've still got a computer um, you might live somewhere where you're very afraid of crime but you shouldn't be because there's very low risk in that case open your doors give your dog to your mayor and you know you might be somewhere like Japan where there is there's no fear of crime and very low risk of crime but that's the ideal but the different responses for different quadrants we need to understand both if we're to make sense of policy the revolution is coming. It started in Bhutan. Um, it's coming through people like Sarkozy, the ex-president of France, who appointed the Stiglitz Commission uh, with, with the Marche Senna I mentioned and Jean-Paul Fatusi. A really nice report two or three years ago on on this and on new measures of social uh, progress and economic performance. Um, on one of those, a big chapter in that on subject of well-being. David Cameron, the Prime Minister of the UK. You know they've got a major official survey now on happiness. He said that, and this is this is a right-wing politician, at least right-wing by European standards. Um, that you know happiness is a fundamental part of his um, his policy. Um, 
and here's his quote. To those, to those, it's a nice quote. To those who say this sounds like a distraction from the serious business of government, I say finding out what will really improve lives and acting on it is the serious business of government. Um, so it's a new science. Um, we know that it matters. It can lead, if you start thinking about this, I mean, Stiglitz, I don't know if we've seen the article you've been writing recently, really nice stuff on cohesion and inequality and what it means and why it's so important for America. Um, and it's, you know, to start thinking about this stuff through these lenses gives rise to new conversations. In the UK, when they really started thinking about this, I guess about 10 years ago when Blair, Blair was around, in the mid-90s, mid Jeff Mulgan, who was Tony Blair's chief of strategy, talks about some of the conversations that happened in Whitehall where all of a sudden uh, people started saying, well, what, what does running a prison policy mean if you're thinking about well-being? Um, and it just led to very rich new conversations. They looked at happiness data in the UK and they discovered uh, in the mid-90s a very unhappy group of people in Britain were middle-aged poor women. Now, okay, maybe that shouldn't come as a surprise, but it did come as a surprise at the meeting. And what was more of a surprise, I think, was that there were no policies aimed specifically at that group that didn't exist. And they, were, they had no, the government had no way of reaching that group. They didn't know where they were. They didn't really know who they were. They didn't know how to, to, to target them in any sort of media campaign. So again, different, different conversations. Um, in the Merseyside police, of, Merseyside is the uh, north, Liverpool, the north of England where the Beatles come from. They, um, it's a very high crime, high crime area. And, you know, when I was living in the UK, and then, if you lost something in Liverpool, the joke was you just would never, you know, just, no crimes were ever solved, there was just so much crime. So the police in Merseyside were stung by this, I suppose, and started looking at people's experiences of uh, police investigations and found that um, you know, what, what makes you happier? How was your interaction with the police when you had your car stolen or your TV stolen? How do you feel? And they were sort of surprised. They imagined, naturally, that people really cared about getting their stuff back. But people actually didn't. They didn't really expect the police to solve the crime. They, they knew how much crime there was. They wanted a letter for their insurance company. And what they really wanted was for the police to keep the appointment on time and turn up at the crime scene give them the letter, ask them the right questions. And, uh, and so that's really changed, that changed the way then Merseyside Police went about things. They put more emphasis on keeping to time and perhaps a little bit less emphasis on um, trying to deal with every crime that was committed because you know, that wasn't really what mattered to people. So another interesting way to think about this. Commuting uh, is another great example. Ed Dina, who I mentioned earlier, mentioned this to one of the, when he gave a talk once, someone said, what's the policy relevance? of all of this stuff on uh, time use diaries and how we feel and he said commuting was the first sort of the classic. Um, again it should come as no surprise but if you look at time use time diary data one of the things that consistently makes people miserable is commuting. Uh, it's you know, We don't enjoy it, it's a horrible thing to have to do and yet we in the West in many countries have sold this idea, the dream is you buy a big house in the suburbs, you move to the suburbs in the UK, you have a long commute to work, well this is quality of life, this is well-being. But it actually isn't, at least not for the person doing the commuting. So, you know, maybe that we should be a bit more honest about that and let, try, let, try and get that data to come out so people know the evidence and they shouldn't be suckered into this, this dream because it might not work like that. And then that, for town planning that might mean let's provide more apartments in the city, let's not worry so much about big suburbs. Or, or better transport systems, or whatever. I mean, there's there's lots of lessons, but it's about getting the facts out there and understanding the, what's really happening. I think that's important. Um, cost benefit analysis. One of the great laws of economics is you can trade off inflation versus unemployment. You know, more uh, you reduce inflation, unemployment goes up. I mean, the, the two things are a link, but no one really sort of knows quite how the exactness of the of the linkages. And they also don't know whether you know, people, what, what makes people more unhappy? Inflation that obviously affects everyone in the population or unemployment which affects, you know, particularly those who are unemployed but there are spillover effects in how it affects the rest of the community who see people on the street who are unemployed or are aware of it and the insecurity that brings. You know, what, what implication do those two different things have on people's overall well-being and does it change the metric? Should we perhaps be willing to tolerate a lot more inflation and a lot less unemployment if we're trying to promote well-being for, for the greatest number. Um, the weekend effect, uh, you know, if, you, if people are really much happier at the weekend than at work, what's going on? 
does that really say something about their managers? Companies, you know, could start looking at this. If you find pockets of people, uh, if you're trying to measure their happiness, who are really miserable, then what does that say about either the work they're doing or the way they're being managed? Something's going on. It's important to understand. Um, another really nice example, which I won't go into here, is um, when countries were responding to the to the, the global financial crisis. Korea, uh, who've long been interested in subjective well-being, they have a very high um, youth suicide rate in Korea, for example, very, very low fertility. They're sort of interested in all of this stuff. They're uh, happy for a while with the OECD. They, their response to the economic crisis was almost like a textbook, let's promote policies that, um, let's use policies to promote well-being. So instead of trying to slash public spending and do all the things that many countries have done, they had a sort of compact with companies saying, try to try not to fire anyone, reduce hours, get the unions on board, don't give any pay rises, but try and keep people employed. We'll do our bit. We'll have some public works from the government. Um, and you know, I don't know a huge amount about this, but I do know that Korea responded, recovered much quicker from the GFC than most, if not all, other countries in the West that were affected. So again, there's a, like a nice example here about how policies that promote well-being can also be really, really good for the economy if anyone doubts it. Um, so it's a new science um, and I think it's the more we find out about this, the more it's going to change how we think about policy. A, a quick example, this is from the uh, Australian Department of Education Workplace Relations. They have a nice mission statement which is pretty good I guess. It's kind of broad and it thinks about outcomes. It talks about um, rewarding economic and social life. But that, you know, if you're to try and you're serious about that as government. You need to know what 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 is a rewarding life. What does that mean? It's not about just about dollars. Uh, how do we understand that? How does education contribute to broader well-being? Um, what are the social outcomes of learning? One thing that strikes me, uh, and I say this from a position of almost total ignorance, about coming to the U.S. is that okay, perhaps the education system doesn't fill people's heads full of as much knowledge as it might do in the U.K in terms of how much stuff young people know when they come out of school. But they do seem to be a more mature, well-rounded, polite bunch of people than some of the, their counterparts in the UK. Now this is completely without any science, but the, the point that I'm making is that education contributes to well-being in many ways. It's not just about filling people's heads with stuff so they can go and get a good job. It's about giving them a rewarding life. We did some work in the OECD on the social outcomes of learning, finding that edu you know, education contributed to people's health in many ways. It, you know, you can take, understand risks better, read the label on, a, on a, a, a bottle of pills better, understand those kind of things. But also in terms of civic engagement, education, more education led to more civic engagement, uh, more um, just a more engaged citizenry. But that wasn't anything really to do with what people, how much people learn. It was more about the length of time they spend in, edu in education. So you might spend five years in college and not actually graduate, but you'd still might be doing rather more, might be more engaged than someone who spent three years and came out with a first class degree. It was something to do, we thought, maybe of the networks that people picked up. We don't really know. I mean, it's super, super complicated, but all of this requires taking a step back and saying, well, you know, what's the ultimate, the ultimate purpose of life is well being in a very broad sense, and how do all the different things we do as government contribute towards that? And all of this requires new measures because you know we manage what we measure. The things we measure affect the choices we make. And if we've got the wrong measures, then we're going to start making the wrong choices. So we do need to start measuring happiness. Um, and that really, I think, is all I wanted to say. Um, it's a quick run through about some of the, why I think this stuff is so important. I can talk more about this now um, if you have questions, or we can talk about the work the UN is doing around the global development agenda and how this may feature in with this. Um, but there is a revolution coming and I think it's, you know, it's, it's not this quote from Eric Hoffer says, it's the change, the change is happening already, so the revolution will follow. Thank you. Beautiful, John. Thank you. We have a few questions, but before we get started, could you just give one or two minutes about um, the Millennium Development Goals? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm getting a lot of echo here, Laura. Okay, that coming from, maybe it's from coming you. from me, so I'm going to mute myself. Okay. So I, I mean, I don't know. It's, I can't sort of see whether people are nodding. How much, if anything, people know about the Millennium Development Goals? But um, back in 2000, the global international community 
decided that um, development aid spending and so on was a bit uh, muddled and there was too too much going on, people bumping into each other, it was too diluted. So wouldn't it be great if the world could agree on a set of goals that we should all aspire to um, to achieve? And there was a Millennium Declaration which all the heads of state signed up for and that then morphed into a set of development goals and then there were some indicators to measure progress towards them. And they were goals around you know, halving world poverty and dealing with health and HIV and uh, there was something on overseas development assistance and so on. That was in 2000, and they, you know, it's the, the, the biggest thing the UN has done, uh, probably ever, I suppose. It's, it governs you know, everything that's going on really in the UN system, eventually ties back to, to the MDGs. It's, it's changed a lot of the way development is thought about and done. Um, people, there are lots of reasons people criticize them, um, but I think generally they're seen as having a very powerful effect in focusing people's attention on a few goals um, and they've helped I think sort of coordinate and align a lot of the development work around the world. Um, so now uh, the, the, when they were said in 2000 the idea was they should all be achieved by 2015 and some of them uh, won't be achieved, some of them have already been achieved including halving world poverty although that's largely been achieved really just because of China and the tremendous economic growth in China possibly nothing really to do with the MDGs. However, um, you know, they're also a very powerful tool in telling a story. If you're trying to tell someone what's going on in the world and what are the things we should think about and how do we sort of campaign for change, then we can appeal to this, these, eight, these eight, eight goals and their indicators. In 2015, the goals expire. They were given over a, a lifetime and something will have to replace them or something should replace them. Um, now the first time the MDGs were done, they kind of, I suppose, came in under the radar a little bit in that various people in Paris, the OCD and others, started having conversations informally and they came up with this idea, I think, really in a, in a, in a small meeting somewhere that wouldn't it be nice to do this. And they, they got it done very fast and it was sort of sprung on people and people thought, yeah, great idea, okay, and they signed up for it because of the, the pressure around the millennium. Now, of course, people are much more aware of A, the importance of these things. Um, and B, the, 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 the time is longer, there's a sort of longer lead in than coming. So it's a much more complicated process this time. Every part of the UN wants to have a say. Uh, people naturally want their own bits of the universe to feature. So if you're working for UN women, you want to make sure there's lots of references to women in the MDGs. If you're working for the, um, you know, bit, working on the environment, then you want the environment to feature, and so on. So first of all, there's a lot, a lot more interest a lot more discussion, a lot more difficulty in reaching agreement. Um, there's also uh, different processes now from the Rio conference, and this is where the Bhutanese work ties into this. There are, the UN is driving the process, but the process is really owned by the world. So the legitimacy for these goals will come from the world's heads of state, who it's hoped in 2014, during the General Assembly of the UN, will agree on a set of goals and indicators. It's, the UN can't do it on its own. It has to, it, it can pave the way and shape the thing, but it has to be agreed by the by elected officials, from, representatives of the world. So the UN was sort of going along this road, but at the Rio conference, there was a reaction to this from the group of 77 countries. He said, well, hang on, we're not sure we necessarily want the UN to be the only people working on this. Uh, we'd like to try and have a go ourselves at doing this. So they called for a set of sustainable development goals to be um, agreed. And it's not at all clear yet how this is going to happen, but at the moment it looks like there'll be a group of 30 nations will be decided by the, 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 the group of 77, uh, so it's mainly developing countries, will then have their own process to come up with a set of sustainable development goals, Colombia, is one of the countries that's been in the lead calling for this. Um, so we're not quite sure how that will happen, but it's 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 great that there's another conversation happening. It adds legitimacy. It can only hopefully make the process richer, but it also makes it more complicated because the UN has another process that's starting in two weeks. It's a high-level panel of people that Ban Ki-moon has appointed, who's the UN Secretary General. 
That's chaired jointly by Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, President of Liberia, David Cameron, Prime Minister of the UK, and the President of Indonesia. And they've got a high-powered panel there talking about what the Millennium Development Goals should look like. They'll be reporting in the spring of next year. The SDG, Sustainable Development Goals work, I think is not due now until it's probably going to start in the spring of next year and will finish in the spring of 2014. Um, now the Bhutanese are also involved in this to an extent. A, they're obviously involved because they're a, they're a nation and they have a say just like everyone else does, so they'll be, they'll be in the UN. But of course they've got their own particular history and experience in this and their own ideas that, that um, they would like to make sure we can benefit from. So they're sort of I think wondering how best to do this. They've now set up uh, a very ambitious um, working group, international working group, that I, some, whoever I think was at the boot, the conference in the UN in April would have seen that. I guess Laura's seen it, their proposals. They've got four different working groups that follow the, the structure of the conference one on happiness and well being, one on, I think, equality, one on um, the environment, and one other I don't remember. Um, but they've got a lot of, they're trying to raise, I think, $4 million for this to, to run over an 18-month period. Uh, they want to have a series of meetings. They've got, they say they've got some very serious people involved, um, a lot of the big names who are at the meeting in April. So the Bhutanese are working on this, and it's about happiness and well-being. It's about gross national happiness, but it's not saying the only way is the Bhutanese way. Um, I think, I suppose they're still deciding their terms of reference, but it's to investigate all this and discuss it with a view to trying to influence, I think, more than anything, the post-2015, what comes after the MDGs, with a view to influencing that discussion. Again, it's not entirely clear how that's going to happen, because there's already a process in place that the UN's running. There's already a second one that's happened with the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, you know, the UN, I don't think, wants lots of national things jumping up and sort of making this even more complicated, but of course it also wants to hear from every country, particularly from Bhutan, which has so much experience. So that's sort of where that's happening at the moment, uh, where that sits. So things are starting in a couple of weeks seriously with the David Cameron uh, panel meeting here, um, and there's a lot, a lot of discussion, a lot of papers coming out all the time, uh, generally saying um, similar things in that we need a stronger conceptual framework for the Millennium Development Goals, um, we need to make sure the environment features more strongly, equity needs to be much more strongly involved, we need to make sure the goals are more universal, uh, although they were sort of universal last time, really they're now only about sub-Saharan Africa, so we need to find a way to do that without, without while still recognizing that the priority should be in many areas of the poorest nations in the world. And I think happiness is something that some people are talking about, should there be a goal just on happiness? Uh, there is some support for that. Um, I'm sure the Bhutanese will be one country sort of championing that. Quite understand, you know, whether and how that will happen. I don't know. But one of the important things, if it did happen, uh, not just the fact that this goal would exist and would be the focus of attention, but it would then lead, you know, a lot more data collection in this area because every country really would be committed then to start measuring this and to understanding. So it could be very interesting and useful. Uh, that's a bit of a ramble about the MDGs. I don't know if that kind of explained things or made it more complicated, but that's probably all I'll say now. But if people have questions, of course, far away. Yeah, thank you. That was very helpful. So I'm going to unmute Dara. Um, Dara, John, and Trish have questions. So I think we probably only have time for two questions, and then we want to do a little wrap up. So I'm not, Dara, I'm going to unmute you if you want to go ahead and ask your question. Mm -hmm. A little loud. Yeah, none of okay. Does Paul have this? I'm going to her. Um, so. So Dara's question, um, John, is yeah. is about um, what, what, here's the question, what are your thoughts about the impact of subjective well-being measures in the U.S. given the current divis divisive political climate? And I would add to that the questions about subjective well-being measures. Um, um, what do you also see as the role of data about, subjective data about the conditions or what Bhutan calls the, the domains of happiness? Sorry, can you say again, What are your thoughts about the impact of, uh, I'm just going to adopt the question a bit. What are your mm -hmm. thoughts about the impact of subjective well-being measures, so both satisfaction with life and affect as well as the conditions or 
what Bhutan calls the domains of happiness mm -hmm. in the U.S., given the current divisive political climate? Okay. I... Um, I mean, I think one thing is it's happiness is... So I think, Laura, I'm getting a lot of echo. Could you mute yourself again? Sorry. One of the things about um, happiness is it's not divisive in that everyone wants to be happy. and no one, no one can possibly be against it. And at least in other countries, it does transcend both left and right. And there's something in it for all political parties. I mean, the, 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 the right might see it as something that um, it's about the freedom to pursue happiness as you want. You know, the, the more sort of left can see other things that matter like equality and equity and so on. So I think it is a way to find common ground. Um, it's a way to sort of understand what matters to people and then the, the conversation, once we can get an understanding of what, what really matters to everyone, then the conversation can be on the policies needed to achieve this. And I remember when Obama um, accepted the nomination for the presidency the Democratic nomination you know, four years ago, whenever it was, five years ago, uh, he made a really nice speech, but he talked about this idea that we may, you know, America's lost its sense of common purpose, and we may never agree on something like abortion, but we, surely we can all agree we want fewer uh, teenage pregnancies. And I think some of that sort of thinking, when it's what makes people happy, what are the things that drive, we can all, everyone can sort of agree on this stuff, then have an argument about the policies needed, which is like, that's politics, that's probably legitimate, but it seems that that conversation doesn't often happen. There's no real understanding or agreement on what um, people really, really want. So how can we have a proper debate about politics? Does that answer the question? There we go. Thank you. Thank you, John. So um, let me, let's go to the next question, and this is from John Haven, so I'll unmute him and see if he can go ahead and ask the question instead of me. John, are you there? Yep, can you hear me? Yes. I can, yep. <clears throat> so, great talk, thank you very much. Wondering, um, this is a geeky question. There's a lot of mobile technologies and apps, um, especially around a movement called health. All that means is something like a Fitbit that measures your health. It seems like that data um, aggregate might be something where you could start to measure people's behavior. Do you see those types of apps or technologies lending credibility to the different research on subjective well-being? Yeah, yeah this has been this huge. There's got to be huge potential there. Um, I didn't. You, you you broke up when you actually said that what the name of this technology was. But but anything that um, you know anything that picks up on how people are feeling. And what people have, there's some really, really interesting presentations on this, but people have looked at the even relationship status changes on Facebook, um, looking at when people split up, and it's you know, just before Christmas or in the middle of the summer holidays, it seems. That's when there are peaks in relationships, which tells you something about the way people are feeling. There's all sorts of information out there that can really, there's so much potential for this stuff. Yeah, there's a huge potential to tap into this. Um, and it's something that people, everyone can answer this easily. It, it's just naturally a very nice question for a, a rapid survey. It doesn't require a lot of thinking and research. You just, how do you feel and what are you doing? You can answer that really fast. So there's enormous potential there, and I think that's all going to come. And there's also potential with all this stuff to then to broadcast the information back to people to get it into the public eye. Like I was saying, the you know to challenge GDP is all of the time confronting people with this. So every time a politician or a banker or a journalist or whoever says starts talking about the economy or the unemployment rate, then people's reaction would be always fine, but what does it mean for our well-being? Let's take it back to that, because that's, at the end of the day, what really matters. Thank you, John. Okay, so um, we have three minutes. I want to say a few things to close. So, um, Trish, you have a question. If you could say this question very quickly, and John, this is a huge <laughs> question. You get two, 30 seconds to answer it. <laughs> Trish? Hi, Laura. Hi, John. The United Nations declared September 21st as International Day of Peace. How does health and happiness link to peace? Um, 
well, I think there's an International Day of Happiness as well, but I can't remember when that is. That's coming. I mean, happiness, of course, peace. It's, it's every every one of these things is an opportunity. Every International Day is is an opportunity to, to to try and show that peaceful countries are more happy. For example, you know, get the get the work from the Global Peace Index. My friends in Australia do look at that, cross correlate that with uh, which countries are happier, and then put that stuff out saying, look at how much peace promotes happiness. And it's, of course, there's obviously very very strong links. Thank you. Well done. <laughs> That's a hard question. Um, so thank you so much, John. This was really, really a wonderful, amazing presentation. Um, we'll be putting the recording of this presentation as well as the deck on Basecamp. You all got should have gotten a, a, a question answer. Please email me if you do not have access to Basecamp. Um, John, if you have any materials that you think it would be good for us to to see or to read, uh, we can post those on Basecamp too, and we'd be really grateful for those. Okay, I've got a couple of short papers I can send you, which deals with some of those stuff. Beautiful, thank you. So thank you all so much for, for attending this. Our next talk is October 25th, and Professor um, Lester Kurtz, who is here, will be giving, giving that talk. So I'm gonna unmute you, um, Lester. Les, if you want to go ahead and say a few minutes, a few sentences. You there? Ah, he's multitasking. <laughs> okay. So um, our next talk is October 25th, and Professor um, Lester Kurtz will be giving that talk. He's from George Mason University. Um, he also was at the, the meeting at the United Nations where we launched a global happiness and well-being movement. So back to John. Thank you, John. Really very, very grateful for this. Um, it was really an excellent talk. I learned a lot and it was very exciting. So it was a pleasure. Thank you everyone for listening. Staying online. Great. All right. Have a wonderful day. Um, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. see.